الحكمة هي الفقه ومعرفة مراد الله ورسوله والحكمة وضع الشيء في موضعه بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله In the name of Allah, all the praises and thanks be to Allah, and may Allah raise the rank and grant peace and blessings upon the Messenger of Allah. Muslim Islamic School in Davao City, Philippines is pleased to present to you a lecture entitled Dua is Ibadah, to be delivered by Al-Ustad Al-Fadil Abbas Abu Yahya, Hafizahullah wa Ra'ah, as part of the two-day webinar under the theme, Preparation for the Month of Ramadan. This 14th day of Sha'aban 1442 Hijri corresponding to the 27th of March 2021 In alhamdulillah Nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'gfiru wa na'udhu billah min shuroori anfusina wa min sayyati a'malina من يحد لله فلا مدل له ومن يدلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله عما بعد فإن خير الكلام كلام الله عز وجل وخير الحدي حجي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدع وكل بدعة دلالة وكل دلالة في النار وبعد Welcome the dear brothers and sisters to a lecture a reminder for us as we enter in to this month of Ramadan, a reminder which hopefully will benefit us. And this being on the 13th of Sha'aban in the year 1442 Al-Hijrah, corresponding to the 27th of March, the year 2021, and we're on the verge of entering into beautiful month of Ramadan, by Allah's permission and blessings. So the reminder that I would like to present to my dear brothers and sisters is something which is not just for Ramadan, even though it's an ideal opportunity, but this is for all time, every day and every time. And this is the topic of making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That dua is worship. Dua, supplicating, asking, requesting, making a talab, requesting, seeking. This is all from asking Allah the creator of the heavens and the earth. So this is the reminder for today, insha'Allah. Because many of us, we face difficulties in our lives, we come across different circumstances, situations, and yet there is an easy way, a simple way, a beautiful way, for us to cope with these different situations. An easy way to relax our hearts in these different circumstances. And that is by turning back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, requesting, asking, seeking from the one who is almighty, from the one who has the capability and the power of of everything, anything and everything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all-powerful, the almighty. He has all capability. And he is the one can make that situation easy for us. He is the one that can make that difficulty 
go away. He is the one that can give ease to our hearts. So why we mention this during the Ramadan is because of the opportunity that we have. This great opportunity that we have in Ramadan to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to request from our Lord who is most kind, most merciful. There is a hadith from the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam which was narrated by the great companion Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiyallahu anhu. And this hadith gives us hope and this gives us encouragement especially during Ramadan. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said Inna lillahi tabarak wa ta'ala utaqa fi kulli yawmin wa layla Inna lillahi tabarak wa ta'ala utaqa fi kulli yawmin wa layla Indeed Allah tabarak wa ta'ala frees slaves every day and night Ya'ni fi Ramadan, meaning in Ramadan. Allah frees slaves. وَإِنَّ لِكُلِّ مُسْلِمٍ فِي كُلِّ يَوْمٍ وَلَيْلَةٍ دَعَوَةٌ مُسْتَجَابَةٍ Indeed, every Muslim has every day and night a supplication that is answered. This is a hadith collected by Al-Bazzar and Shaykh Al-Albani declared it to be Sahih li ghayrihi. So this hadith gives us hope. And gives us encouragement and it incites us to during Ramadan that we make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during the time, the day and the night in Ramadan specifically because a Muslim has a supplication that is answered. And the main supplication that we make to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is for entry into his paradise and keeping away from the hellfire. Entry into Allah's paradise where we will live for eternity in peace and tranquility and luxuries and enjoyment. Something that cannot even, you can't even imagine. That's how beautiful it is. And we know this be a reality. This is a real thing. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for paradise. And we ask Allah save us from the hellfire due to our sinning, shortcomings, deficiencies. Oh Allah keep the hellfire away from us. And such a beautiful time in Ramadan. Why? Because the Prophet said that every Muslim has a da'wah to mustajaba. A da'wah, a dua, a supplication asking Allah which is answered during Ramadan. During Ramadan. So this is a fadila. This is an excellence. Which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. And Ramadan is just around the corner. And that's why the Salaf, they used to wish that they uh, live until Ramadan. Because it's an opportunity for them. It's an opportunity. There's no specific dua that the Salaf used to make. Because there is uh, widespread amongst the Muslim ummah that that they used to make a du'a specifically, well, no, this is not authentic, but generally a person can make a du'a general, oh Allah, keep me alive till Ramadan, oh Allah, make Ramadan opportunity for me, oh Allah, uh, Allahumma, yani, forgive me in, in, during Ramadan, but there's no specific du'a, there's no specific du'a authentically mentioned from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Oh, you know, oh Allah, make me live or make keep me alive and make me reach Ramadan. No, but generally we can say this. Generally, we can make du'as during Rama uh, during any time that we reach Ramadan. So Ramadan is an opportunity, and it's not just for us that we make du'a ourselves that we have that Allah answers du'a, du'a because Allah is the one who hears everything. Allah hears the call of the person making du'a. Okay? The person making du'a, making a supplication, asking Allah. But, rather, in fact, we even have the angels making du'a for us in Ramadan. How? 
This is because we have a hadith from Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, anhu, the great companion of the Prophet And as we know, the hadith of the Prophet are not from his own whims and desires. The Prophet wasallam, when he spoke about the religion of Allah, he conveyed the revelation. It was not something from his own desires. It was not something from his own mind. Rather, it was Allah sending the revelation down to him. That's why we have a strong attachment to that authentic hadith. The hadith is sahih. We have a strong attachment to it. Because we know it's revelation from Allah. Because there are people, the Muslims, some Muslims who would say, Oh, we just yaktafi bil Qur'an. Qur'an is sufficient for us. And not turn to the hadith. Oh, because we don't know the big doubts and shabahat and doubts of the hadith. La ya sheikh. That was not the case. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down the kitab wal hikmah. Uh, and the hikmah here, the tafsir as Imam Shafi'i and all the other scholars have mentioned, majority of the scholars have mentioned, the hikmah here is the sunnah, the practice of the Prophet Wasallam. Allah didn't create us and just leave us fumbling in the dark to learn how to worship Allah, but rather Allah set the rules and regulations, the Qur'an, and explained it by the sunnah, the prof, the example, the practice, the statements, the allowances, of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and make it even precise. More than that, Allah subhanahu wa taala raised an ummah, raised a generation of people that were the best generation, they had the most purest of hearts, and they were the Sahaba, the Salaf of this ummah. So, where is the Muslim ummah now? Why is the Muslim Ummah in this situation? Because they're moving away, further away from the Qur'an and the Sunnah and the Fahm al-Salaf al Moving away from that understanding, the correct understanding, because people, they've become deceived by the shaitan to say, no, my intellect says better. I understand what Allah said better than you do. I understand it better than the Salaf did before. Uh, I understand it better because I've got a degree, I've got a master's, I've got a PhD. Oh, we live in the 21st, you know, in 2021. We've got technology, we've got a civilized, oh, this is all kalam fadi, it's all kalam fadi, it has no validity to what this, this statement, the, the companions were the best of the people. So we have a strong attachment to the hadith and a strong attachment to the way of the salaf. So this hadith from the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentions, As-suhuru, akluhu baraka. As-suhur, suhur is the food which is eaten at the time uh, before fajr, before at the eating at the time of suhur and eating at the time just before fajr when you're fasting. As-suhur, akluhu baraka. So eating at the time of suhoor is blessed. فَلَا تَدْعُوهُ So do not leave it. And you make sure you try to get up and eat suhoor. Eat some food, a little bit of food, whatever it is, when you decide you have the intention to keep a fast. So don't leave it. وَلَوْ أَنَّ يَجْرَ أَهْدُكُمْ جُرْعَةٌ مِنْ مَاءٍ يعني مِنْ مَاءٍ that even if a person was to take a sip of water, then he should do so. فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ وَمَلَائِكَتُهُ يُسَلُّونَ عَلَى مُتَسَحِّرِينَ Because indeed Allah sends praise and His angels make dua for those who eat at the time of suhoor. This is a hadith which is collected by Imam Ahmad and Shaykh al-Albani graded it as Hassan. So eating at the time of suhoor is blessed. So do not leave it. Even if one of you were to take a sip of water, then you should do so. Indeed, Allah sends praise and his angels make dua for those who eat at the time of suhoor. So subhanAllah, look at that. Such a beautiful opportunity. Beautiful opportunity that we make dua and the angels make dua for us. How can a person be in loss when the angels... And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises a person. And angels make dua for that person. That he woke up 
for the sake of Allah. He's having a nice sleep, nice and comfortable pillow, or oh, deep in sleep, such, uh, uh, such bliss that a person's in. He's got the blanket, or he's got the cover over him, relaxing, or enjoying, or oh, sleeping, huh? But he wakes up for the sake of Allah. And what is he doing? He's not praying. He's not making dua. He's not uh, making sajda. He's not reading Quran. He's eating food. SubhanAllah, look at that. <laughs> Allah is so merciful that even for just eating food, drinking a sip of water, oh, the angels are sending dua for us. Angels are sending dua for us. SubhanAllah, look at the, how beautiful the religion of Islam is, how easy it is, and how blessed it is. So Ramadan is an opportunity, opportunity for making dua. And as we know, that dua is actually worship. SubhanAllah, me asking Allah for something, me requesting something from Allah, supplicating to Allah, is actually worship. Because Allah loves that a slave of his asks Allah for something. That he's needy. He acknowledges this, that I am in need of anything and everything. And who can fulfill that need of mine is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah will make means and ways for a person, uh, for his needs. So we know that dua is actually worship. We're getting rewarded for asking Allah. Subhanallah, look at that. We're actually getting rewarded for asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And do we know this from a hadith from Nu'man ibn Bashir, radiallahu anhu, the great companion of the Prophet sallallahu who said, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi said, uh, dua huwa al-ibadah, dua is worship. Subhanallah. Beautiful statement, look at that. Just three words, dua huwa ibada. There's another narration which says, dua mukhal ibada, that it is the, the brain or the, the, the central part of worship. But that is not authentic, that wording. The meaning is correct, obviously, because it's the same, but the wording isn't correct. But the wording which is sahih, and this is what we advise the people to go back to the authentic hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Reviving the sunnah, reviving this love and attachment to find out what did the Prophet Sallallahu say? How was this understood by the Salaf? And I want to implement it. I want to practice it. I want to be from the foremost of the Muslims in obedience to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala and following the Prophet and and being like the Prophet and he's my example to follow. So we encourage the brothers and sisters to read as much as they can. The sahih, authentic hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu So they get a clear picture, clear jigsaw of how the life of the Prophet Sallallahu was. How the orders of the Prophet Sallallahu were. How the recommendations of the Prophet Sallallahu were. How the barakah, the blessings of following the sunnah is. So we encourage the dear brothers and sisters to read as much as they can the authentic hadith. Not to go around giving fatwa. La. Not in t- mentioning this. We're telling, read the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, Dua huwa al-ibadah. Dua is worship. Then he recited. Subhanallah. Then he recited an ayah. Wa qala rabbukum mud'uni astajib lakum. And your Lord said, invoke me, call upon me, ask me for anything. I will respond to your uh, in, invocation. I will respond to your du'a. وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ عُدْعُونِي أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ Call upon me. Make du'a upon me. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَسْتَكْبِرُونَ عَنْ إِبَادَتِي Verily, those who scorn my worship, يعني, do not invoke me, and do not believe in me. Look how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly mentions in this ayah, those يَسْتَكْبِرُونَ يعني, uh, Arrogant and respond and reject an ibadati, and he's connected it up to, for my worship, connected up to dua. Make dua to me, and it's from worship. And what will happen to these people? Sayyadhuluna jahannam adakhirin. And they will enter, surely enter hellfire in humiliation. In Surah Ghafir, Ayah 60. 
آیا وقال ربكم ادعوني استجب لكم ان الذين يستكبرون عن عبادتي سيدخلون جهنم داخرين and your lord said call upon me i will respond to your invocation astajib lakum not the one in the grave we find some muslims going they feel so desperate they feel so needy rather than turning to allah they go to a shrine a building with a dead person's uh, grave inside and they think that this person is some holy religious person and he's closer to allah because he was a ca- kind religious righteous man so let me make dua to this man maybe he can be in the middle be an in- mi- middle man maybe he can be an intercessor for me between me and allah and allah will answer my dua du- 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 la this is shirk this is associating partners with allah a person goes to a, a, a grave and he says it's a grave and he says oh this is a religious grave oh look Look how people have looked after it and they've taken care of this grave. That means that he must be a man of great status with Allah. Let's be make dua to him. I, I need, I need, I need money. Let me make dua to him. This is shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our religion is clear. Islam is clear. We don't have any intercessor. We don't have intermediaries. We don't need to go to the grave of Al Hussein or Al Hassan or Hussein al-Badwi in Egypt into the, to the, the, to the grave and, which is built, uh, uh, built inside a masjid and ask them. Yeah? And it's so easy to, uh, to, uh, to refute their claims when they say, oh, if you're sick, why don't you go to the grave of al-Hussein in Egypt and you're, you know, you're, you'll, you'll be cured. Ya Shaykh, none of the Sahaba went to the grave of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the best of creation. His grave is in Medina, but, and the companions were there, then none of them actually ever, ever went there to make dua to the grave of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. None of them. There's not a single narration of that. Not a single narration, rather the opposite, that we make dua to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And this narration which we mentioned, Dua al is collected by Imam Abu Dawood, Dirmidhi Ibn Maji, and Shaykh al-Abani authenticated in Sahih al-Jami. So we find that Dua is worship. Dua is worship. And we find that this statement of Dua, this uh, thing of supplication, this matter, this issue, you'll find it central all the way for the Qur'an. From the beginning to the end, you'll find that this is central to the, the deen of Islam, the central to the, uh, the Qur'an, in the Qur'an. From the beginning to the end, Allah always telling the people, make dua to me, make dua to me, make dua to me. Don't make dua, don't call upon others, don't, don't invoke others, don't call upon, because it's such a central point, such a, a principle of the religion of Islam, such a principle of our daily lives, that it's mentioned all the way through the Qur'an. There's not a single surah except you'll find that there will be a mention of calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even surah Fatiha, إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُوا وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ Indeed, you are the one that we call upon. We say, اِحْدِنَ الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ Guide us to the straight path. It's a dua. Guide us to the straight path, the path of the salaf. As, as, as is the tafsir of this ayah, as has been mentioned by Shaykh Uthaymeen and Ibn Kathir and others. Ihdin as-sirat al-mustaqim, the path of the salaf al-ummah. Subhanallah, so it's central. Dua, making dua is central. And we find later on, we'll find that dua, it doesn't have to be that you raise your hands. Because some people, yeah, the Muslims, they think dua is only when you raise your hands and ask Allah for something. No. A dua can be said without raising your hands. You could be walking, you could be cycling, you could be driving, you could be in the classroom, you could be in the masjid, you can be lying down about to fall asleep. You can make dua. Oh Allah, Allahumma, oh Allah, forgive me. Oh Allah, make my life easy. Oh Allah, I've got this meeting. Allah, make it easy. Oh Allah, I've got this exam. Make it easy for me. Don't make it difficult for me. Oh Allah. Asking Allah for anything and everything. 
Sheikh Islam ibn Taymiyyah, he said, dua is worship. He said, worship is built upon the sunnah and following the messenger, and not upon desires and innovating. Dua is worship. Worship is built upon the sunnah and following the messenger, and not upon desires and innovating. Indeed, Allah is worshipped with, with what he has legislated. He is not worshipped with desires and innovations. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Am lahum shuraka or have they partnered with, with Allah, false gods, who have instituted for them, who have allowed it, made uh, described for them a religion which Allah has not allowed? Surah Shura, Shura Ayah 21. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also said, إِنَّهُ لَا يُحِبُّ الْمُعْتَدِينَ He does not love, does not like the aggressors. And this was after his statement, and invoke your Lord with humility and in secret. So after that he says, Allah does not love the aggressors. The, uh, the Shaykh Salam ibn Taymiyyah, he said, this is evidence that whoever does not make dua to Allah with humility and in secret is one of the aggressors whom Allah does not love. Subhanallah, amazing, beautiful benefit. That we make dua to Allah with humility Because Allah is the one who gives And we are the ones that are asking And we make it openly and we make it in secret Because we make it in secret yani, Not that we do it in our hearts Like some people say Some people they say Oh you make your dua in your heart No, you actually say it with your lips You actually say it with your lips And you pronounce it But you don't say it loud Don't shout it out Because Allah has everything Allah has the, 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 the steps that, the sound that the steps make, that an ant make when it's walking under a rock. Allah hears those sounds. Allah hears those sounds of those ants. Allah has knowledge of that. So we don't need to make dua yani in a loud voice. Okay? We don't need to make dua in a loud voice, but we can make it yani audibly so we can hear it. And Allah does not love the aggressors. Al-Mubarak Furi, rahimullah, the one who, uh, the old, old scholar, okay, there's many, this is a, a family of, or a tribe of scholars, Al-Mubarak Furi, but there was a great scholar who wrote an explanation of a tirmidhi uh, and Mubarak Furi, and he said, uh, uh, he said, and this is worship in reality, which deserves to be called worship. Due to the indication that making dua is turning to Allah and turning away from everything except Him, whereby a person does not have hope or fear except of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, let's look at a summary from the research of Ibn Qayyim al-Himullah, where he mentioned the description of the dua and dua and what it comprises of and everything. And this is a dua which probably will not be rejected, yani as long as some of these conditions are met, or you know the, uh, the 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 points are met, then Allah answers the dua. Because imagine, because Allah answers the supplication even of a non-Muslim. Allah answers the dua even of a non-Muslim when he turns to Allah. Huh? When a non-Muslim he says, Oh God, Oh Allah, Oh my Creator, Oh my Lord. Because he, maybe he doesn't know who his Lord is. Yeah? He doesn't know. Yeah? And we're not talking about people who say, Oh Jesus is my Lord and I make supplication to him. Or Vishnu is my Lord. Or Krishna is my Lord. No. We're saying a person who's sincere, he doesn't know who his Lord is. He doesn't know about Islam. He just sincere. So he says, Oh my Lord, my Creator, Oh my God, guide me. Yeah? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides him to Islam. Allah guides him to Islam. Even, and that's why we've been told by the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that not to oppress anybody. Because the dua of the oppressor the supplication of the, of the, sorry, the supplication of the oppressed is answered. 
even if it's not a, a, a non-Muslim, even if it's a non-Muslim, so we're not allowed to oppress even the non-Muslims. We're not allowed to oppress them. We can't do bad things to them. We can't do thulam to them. We can't cheat them. We can't lie to them. We can't steal from them. It's not permissible in Islam. So the Prophet have told us, be careful uh, of the dua of the oppressed, even if it's not a non-Muslim. So here, uh, some of the conditions that we find uh, that Ibn Qayyim uh, summarized in a beautiful book, it's called Dawa Dawa, and the illness and the cure. A beautiful, amazing masterpiece of a, of a book. And in it, he mentions, he says, if making dua comprises of, and then he gives the following points, and we're going to break these points up. He says, comprises of one, presence of the heart, and giving its complete attention to what is requested. Yeah? Having presence of the heart. So when we're making dua, it's not just mere lip service. It's that we really intentionally, sincerely mean what we're asking for. We're sincerely asking Allah for something. With sincerity, with certainty, with I want and a desire from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Regarding this, Sheikh, Sheikh, Sheikh uh, Muhammad Musa Ali Uthaymin, Rasulullah said, regarding this point, sorry, it is necessary along with making dua that you have hope. You have hope. You, know, you have certainty. You have ikhlas. You, know, you have sincerity. It says necessary along with making dua that you have hope. As for the neglectful, distracted heart, which remembers making dua out of habit, then it is not worthy and appropriate that the dua will be responded to. So you find many people, straight after the prayer, they've pr- finished their fard prayer, the salah, straight away they rush and raise their hands and start, start making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They do this out of habit. They do this because they've seen other people doing so. They do this because their forefathers did it, or the imam in the masjid did it. They don't do this based upon the sunnah because dua after the prayer hasn't been legislated. What has been legislated, okay, that which is in the sharia is to make dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu after the, the, the prayer, after saying, Salaamu Alaikum, Salaamu Alaikum, he would send some adhkar and then he would say, Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, and, and the ayat al-Qursi and these are. Nowhere has it been mentioned, and the scholars mentioned this, that is it um, uh, mentioned that this is at the time when the Prophet ﷺ did dua. Even though some scholars do mention that it is permissible, you know, meaning now and then, now and then if you did dua at that time, it's okay, some of them. But because the people have taken it as a regular practice, Straight away, soon as they raise their hands really high up and they start asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they forget the sunnah, the practice of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Did the Prophet Muhammad do that? Did the Sahaba do that? No. So if a person does it occasionally, then la but, then no problem. But, however, if the people in the community are all doing it, then a person shouldn't do it. To show that this is the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Not as an arrogant thing, oh, look at me, I've got knowledge and you're ignorant, jahil, you don't know, look at you. Huh? No, we don't do it like that. Huh? We want to encourage and educate and teach the people. The people just don't know. They just don't know. They don't. They think, and then when you don't make dua, they say, oh, look at you, you don't even make dua, that's why you're a Wahhabi. Huh? That's why you... Uh, you don't send salat on the Prophet sallallahu alaihi and all these type of things, and these this is all falsehood and not correct. Okay, so it is necessary to have uh, so to have a, a, a attentive heart uh, and uh, be aware and not be distracted and 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 and, uh, and not to make du'a out of habit, but rather paying attention. The, the Sheikh Zaymin continues. He says this is opposite to dhikr. Like saying tasbih, 
يعني سبحان الله لا إله إلا then this is given its reward equivalently however it's less than that it is less than if he has an attentive uh, and if he was attentive and made thicker with his heart and tongue uh, then he continues he says the difference is clear because a person making dua is in need so it is necessary that he brings to attention in his heart that he is in need of and that he is in need the great need of Allah Azza wa Jal Ibn Qayyim also uh, so, uh, in another place mentions about this that indeed dua is the strongest means in repelling that which is disliked anything that you dislike dua is the strongest means and in achieving that which one hopes for and requests. However, the effect of the dua may not appear. I made dua, I made dua, I made dua, but it doesn't occur. He says, either due to the weakness in the dua itself, yani, the person didn't have that strong yearning and sincerity. He just said it. Huh? That it was a dua, he continues, he said, it was a dua which Allah did not love due to what it contained of enmity and hostility, that somebody makes a dua which is oppressive, unjust. We're not talking about a dua when a person is saying it's for his right and somebody oppresses him and these type of things. No, no. We're talking about when a person from himself, just because he doesn't like somebody for no reason or anything like that, he makes a dua which contains enmity or hostility or anything bad. And he continues, he says, or due to the weakness of the heart and not turning to Allah. Huh? Weakness of the heart and not turning to Allah. So he makes dua, but it's half-hearted. He's not sincere. He's not saying it with real meaning from the, from the depths of his heart. So he can be weak because of that. He might not be accepted. Or combining these two things at the time of supplication. Not having a having an attentive heart, and you a heart which is alive, a heart which is paying attention to what he's asking for, yeah? and turning to Allah. He says this would be similar to a very low, loose bow. So the arrow would leave the bow very weakly. So when you have a bow and arrow, and you know, you, you, if the the bow is not taut and tight, and you know, you know, if you ever see a bow and arrow, yeah. If it's not tight and not stretched and it's strong, eh, this will be similar to a very loose bow, so the arrow would leave the bow very weakly. This would was due to either a prevention of the acceptance of the dua. Yeah, there could be something that prevents that dua being accepted by Allah. And one of them is eating haram. Meaning, not eating haram food, no. It means that a person gets his rizq from a haram way. He steals his money. He steals his money for what he wants to eat with. I mean, he gets, steals his money. Or he cheats the people. He lies to them. Eh? He embezzles from a company or from his work. And he is eating haram. He's feeding his children, his family haram. Or, the Sheikh said, uh, Sheikh Salam uh, Ibn Qayyim said, oppression could be a means for a person's dua not being accepted. The heart becoming overcome with sins. Huh? The prevalence of neglectfulness is ghafil. He doesn't you know, pay attention. Distracted. He's thinking about other things. To be heedless and all this subduing his, the heart. Yani causing the heart to be tight. His heart is not yani, free and alive. Okay? As is mentioned, he said, Ibn Qayyim says, as is mentioned in the Sahih of Al-Hakim, from the Hadith of Abu Huraira, from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Udu Allah Ta'ala, wa antum muqinun bil ijaba. And he make dua to Allah, supplicate to Allah, invoke upon Allah, with certainty that he will answer. Wa'lamu anna Allah la yastajiba dua min qalbin ghafinin lahi. Okay? And know that Allah does not accept the dua from a heart which is neglectful of Him. Huh? Playful, neglectful, yani not paying attention. Allah will not accept that dua. And this is a hadith which is being collected uh, also by Tirmidhi as well as Hakim and Shaykh al-Albani mention it in As-Sahih, as sahih So this t- shows us that we should have a heart which is attentive. 
He continues, he says, so this is the beneficial med- medication for removal of sickness. But the heart being neglectful of Allah nullifies its nourishment. Likewise, eating from haram means also nullifies its nourishment and weakness and weakens it, as is mentioned in Sahih Muslim from the hadith of Abu Huraira, who said the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu said, Allah the Almighty is good and accepts only that which is good. Allah has commanded the believers to do that which he commanded the messengers. And Allah the Almighty has said, O you messengers, eat of the good things and do righteous deeds. And Allah the Almighty has said, O you who believe, eat of the good things where we have provided for you. Then he mentioned the case of a man who having journeyed far is disheveled, his hair is all messed up and dusty and spreads out his hands to the sky saying, Oh my Lord, Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi, while his food is haram, his drink is haram, his clothing is haram and he is nourished unlawfully. So how can he be answered? And this is an authentic hadith, uh, authenticated by Shaykh al-Albani. So this is the first point uh, Ibn Qayyim brings. Having a heart which is alive and, and paying attention to when he makes dua. Number two, the dua which coincides with one of the six times when dua is answered. And it's more than six times. Yeah, this is, he was just summarizing, Ibn Qayyim was just summarizing that when dua can be uh, answered. Uh, when a dua can be answered. Um, what I would like you to do now is to think about maybe three th- times, three times when a dua can be answered. Uh, we think when a dua or the best time for making dua. I think each one of you should stop and think. Yeah. If they know, especially from the hadith of the Prophet, so that's, you know, uh, that's where we should. Um, that's what I mean. Sorry. I mean, refer back to that where you know that a dua is answered. So one of them is the last third of the night. The last third of the night, the time of tahajjud, just before the uh, fajr prayer. Last third of the night, a dua is answered. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descends. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descends down to the lowest heaven and asks, who of my slaves is asking for forgiveness? Or is asking me for something so I can give it to him. Okay. Another time is between the adhan and iqama. The Prophet also mentioned that between the time of adhan and iqama, the dua is answered. Also, the last part of the afternoon on Friday, on Friday on the day of Juma, between the Asr and the Maghrib prayer, is a time when a dua is mustajab, that dua is answered. Likewise, and some of these Ibn Qayyim Rahimullah mentions, but I'm just uh, adding to it, uh, like the scholars have mentioned, from the hadith of the Prophet at the time of rain, when it starts raining, it's one of the best times to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there are some others as well. Number three, having a humble heart in front of your Lord. And this was mentioned before by Ibn Qayyim, and from that, Shaykh Thaymin said, the conditions for the acceptance of a dua are ikhlas, sincerity, that dua should not have enmity in it, and it is conditional that uh, one makes dua with certainty that Allah will respond, and do not make your dua experimental. Okay, and keeping away from haram income. Number four, facing the Qibla whilst making dua. Even though this is not so, uh, 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 an obligation, yeah, it's not an obli- on a, a wajib, but it is recommended, it's better to face the Qibla when a person needs to, yeah, to make dua, but he doesn't have to. He doesn't have to face the Qibla to make dua. He can make dua without having to face the Qibla. Yeah, facing Mecca, but we know there are these circumstances when the Prophet ﷺ, like in the Battle of Badr, he faced towards the Qibla and made dua for, uh, the, uh, for su- success in the battle. Number five, Ibn Qayyim mentions, is to be upon purifications while making dua, and yani being upon wudu, yeah, being purified, being, you know, um, but even then, if a person doesn't have wudu and he needs to make dua, he needs to supplicate to Allah, it's permissible. But we're talking about 
those matters which it is better to do so. Another one, number six, is raising one's hands to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Raising one's hands. Now we find that this was the case with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa that sometimes he would raise his hands. And raising of the hands hasn't been specifically mentioned as, as far as I know. Wallahu a'lam from what I, you know, learned from the scholars. It hasn't been mentioned, but the closest is that a person, from what we, the scholars of Medina have mentioned, is that a person raises his hands with his palms facing the, the sky, okay, facing the sky, okay, and uh, the hands being uh, put together, and he saw the right hand is next to the left hand, with the hands stretched out, okay, like somebody's trying to... Uh, 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 so someone's giving someone some sweets or chocolates and he's, he's cupping his hands to um, catch those sweets or hold those sweets or chocolates or whatever <laughs> uh, and he's putting them together because some people they put them separate and it's not a problem if one, someone does that as far as I know Wallahu A'lam, is that they raise their hands putting their hands together uh, and, and uh, keeping their hands outstretched and this is, wallahu a'lam, yani closer to the, the sunnah. So raising one hand, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but again, we don't have to raise our hands. Certain situations, you're in the classroom, in your class, and yet the instructor, the teacher is asking questions to everybody, and you know your turn's gonna come soon, and you don't know the answer, you say, oh Allah, make it easy for me, oh Allah, make me know the answer, oh Allah, Make the teacher skip me and do it for the next student. Huh? <laughs> oh Allah, protect me. Oh Allah, save me. <laughs> so we don't have to raise our hand. We don't have to raise our hand in making dua. We can just say it. But raising the hands is something which is legislated from the Prophet ﷺ, so much so that he used to raise his hands so high that that that, that, from the, that you know they, they could see from the side of his of his body because in those times they never used to wear what we wear nowadays in those days they used to wear just a cloth like when you see somebody in a haram so when somebody raises their ha- ha- hands to make dua above their head or higher yeah, you could see the side of their their body their torso their the the arms and these, so the prophet, uh, this has been mentioned in the authentic hadith that the prophet did this. As for wiping the hands on the face after ending the dua, the Shaykh al-Albani rahimullah says this is not established with an authentic narration, nor in the authentic uh, statement, nor by an analogy. He says this is a bidder, an innovation. As for outside the prayer, it is not authentic. Uh, not authentic. And everything that is narrated regarding this is weak. Some narrations are weaker than others. And he has researched them. And, and, and he said that is why Is Ibn, uh, Al-Iz ibn Abdul Salam said in some of his fatawa, none does this except an ignorant person. So Shaykh al-Albani Allah, said, so it should not be done. And one should restrict oneself to what the Salaf radiallahu anhu did. Raising the, the hands in the dua without wiping the face in the prayer. And the success lies with Allah. And this is what Shaykh al-Albani mentions. So when we make dua, we raise our hands and we just put our hands down. That's it. We put our hands together and make dua and put our hands down. And likewise, the, there is no dua like putting your hands together and everybody coming together and making a dua after a dars, after a lesson. Rather, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi the person giving the lecture, would say, "Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika, shadu wa la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa tuqo alaik." Or send salat upon the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and that would be it. As for asking somebody, make du'a, make du'a, brother, brother, please make du'a after the. This is not from the Sunnah. This is not from the Sunnah. Rather, this is an innovation. A practice which is not practiced by the Prophet or his companions. Occasionally, if somebody wants to do make a du'a for a reason or something like this, then this is a different uh, ball game. However, because the people practice this so much, 
We do not do it. We practice and revive the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu In the dua itself, Ibn Qayyim al mentions number seven, beginning with praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and glorifying Him. And number eight, then sending salat wa salam upon the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we see this from the hadith of Fadalat ibn, uh, Fadalat ibn Ubaid, a companion of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who said that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam heard a man making dua in his prayer, making dua in his prayers, and he did not praise Allah. See? He did not praise Allah. So, for example, when we say, we're making dua, Allahumma, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Like that Very simple, very easy He did not praise Allah So we can begin our du'as by Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen And, he, and, and, and the, the companion mentioned And he did not send salat upon the Prophet Sallallahu So the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said Hasten your own du'a When he called the man or another person He said If one of you makes du'a Then he should begin with the praise of Allah And glorify him then salat, send salat upon the, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Then after that make dua with what you like And this is a hadith collected by uh, Imam Nisa'i And Shaykh Al-Albani said his son is Hasan If one of you makes dua He should begin with the praise of Allah and glorify him So saying Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, uh, La ilaha illallah Anything like this yani, state Mentioning Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala When making dua Then sending salat Allahumma salli ala Muhammad uh, Muhammad, like this, as-salatu was salam ala Rasulillah, like this, then after that make dua with whatever you wish. Ibn Qayyim rahimullah said about this point in another place, he said, as-salat upon the Prophet sallam in the dua is the status of Surah Fatiha in the prayer. Look at that, subhanallah. Uh, sending salat on the Prophet in the dua is the status of Surah Fatiha in the prayer. Like when we pray, uh, the, the salah, we say, Surah Fatiha, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman, ar It's just like that we have salat in the dua. He said, so the key to dua is salat upon the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as a purification, as purification is the key for the prayer. Just like when we make wudu to get ready for the salah, likewise, uh, uh, the key to dua is salat upon the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then he said, may Allah send salat upon him. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam And his family uh, Tasliman So whenever the Prophet Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is mentioned We mention at that as well We say Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam And every time we say that We get ten rewards Ten rewards And Imam Nawawi said about this The scholars are agreed upon That it is recommended to start the dua with hamd Praise for Allah and glorify Him. Then to send salat upon the Messenger of Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And likewise to end the dua with that. The athar regarding this point are many and well known. Okay, So this is uh, something which is encouraged and recommended that we do. Number nine. Point number nine. Ibn Qayyim says, To proceed what you ask for by repenting and seeking forgiveness. La ilaha illallah. Subhanallah. When we are asking Allah for something, to before that, you ask, Astaghfirullah, Allahumma tfirli, O oh Allah, forgive me, uh, I seek refuge in you, I seek, uh, seek your forgiveness, Astaghfirullah, before asking what you want. And that's a beautiful thing, beautiful thing, especially when a person's in a state of confusion, a, pers- a person is in a state of anxiety, a person is in a state of he needs something and he's in despair, Straight away he says, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah, Tuba Alaik, Astaghfirullah, Tuba Alaik, Ya Rabbi. And then asks for someone. Why? Because this is stronger in your dua being uh, answered. Number 10, supplicating to Allah for your need and beseeching Him for what you request with humbleness, making dua to Allah with fervent desire and fear, as we mentioned before. Likewise, we don't say please. You know, some people, they think that when we're making dua, we say, oh Allah, please give me this. La. We say, oh Allah, give me this. And we're not saying it out of arrogance. We're not saying it out of that at all. We are rather, we're saying it because we need it. We supplicate to Allah for your need and beseeching Him and requesting. So Allah loves it that we ask Allah. Allah is so rich. He's so rich. Yani, uh, His 
uh, wealth of everything that Allah has is endless. Imagine, think about the richest person you, you know that you've heard of. Richest person. What does he have? Nothing. Nothing. Oh, come on, man. What are you talking about? You know, the guy who owns Microsoft, or Apple, you know, they're super rich people. Yes. But they have nothing. Because only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has everything. Allah's wealth is infinite. Allah's, um, what Allah has, it has no limit to it. Allah is the richest. Huh? Allah is the most. So we ask Allah. We don't say, please, Allah, give me this. Because Allah wants us to ask Him. Okay? Allah wants to give to us. And that's why we make dua like that. Number 11, seeking closeness to Allah with His names and attributes. And His tawheed. Especially with what is mentioned in some of the narrations about Allah's great name. By what, by which if one supplicates, the dua is answered. Al-Hayyul Qayyum. O Allah. O, O saying. Dhul Jalali wal Ikram, and these type of beautiful names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or saying, La ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntu min al Mean, there is none worthy of worship in truth except you. You are far from imperfection. Indeed, I am the oppressive. Or the, the dua for the distress, and these type of matters. As is mentioned by Ibn Qayyim and others. And then, number 12, is to proceed the dua by giving sadaqah. Yeah? To proceed the dua by giving sadaqah. And this is something which is... Um, Permissible, permissible, yeah, uh, and it's mentioned in the Quran as well, um, that you give some sadaqa, you know, some charity, not that you're gonna get something back and that's why I'm giving charity, la, but the, the, by doing good actions, by doing good deed. And then after listing, list, listing all this, Ibn Qayyim rahimullah said, indeed this dua will probably not be ever rejected. Indeed, this dua, this request that a person makes will probably not be ever rejected. Subhanallah. Look at the strength, the quwa of those, uh, uh, the quwa of the, the strength of those words uh, by Ibn Qayyim rahimullah. With that, we've come to the end of this, uh, small reminder, ya akhwan, ya akhwat. Um, even though there's so much more that we can talk about, so much more that we can talk about regarding dua and regarding what types of dua, especially during Ramadan, especially during the 27th night, about asking Allah for pardon and forgiveness. And there are many, many uh, dua and adhkar, and you can find them on uh, um Translated by many of the dear brothers, like our brother Abu Khadija, Hafadullah Ta'ala, he, on his website dot com, you'll find these uh, supplications that can be recited. And likewise, on another website, a smaller website called followingthesunnah.com, dot com, there you can find general supplications which can be said during the Ramadan. And from them, La ilaha illallah anta subhanaka inni kuntum minal thalameen. From them, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fi al-akhirita hasana wa kina adhaaban naar. And many, many other adhkar and dua that a person can say, asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his forgiveness, for his mercy, for his pardoning, and asking for the, 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 the good of this dunya and in the hereafter, and, and the hereafter. Jazakum Allah khairan for listening. May Allah reward the dear brothers and sisters who organize these these uh, webinars and these seminars and these lectures. May Allah reward them with goodness and may Allah make it a means of uh, reward for them and make it heavy on their scales of good deeds on the day of judgment. May Allah give success to the, the this webinar and, and the others and uh, may Allah protect and Strengthen the one, the people who attend and listen to these, uh, these lectures which I've been doing these last couple of days is for this webinar. And may Allah, uh, reward them with goodness. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Ashadu wa la ilaha illallah. Anta astaghfiruka wa tubu alayk. Wa sallallahu ala nabiyana Muhammad. Okay, there's been a couple of questions that have been sent. Um, I think I answered most of them in the actual um, the, the 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 talk, 
a reminder. Uh, one of them is how to begin the supplication by saying Alhamdulillah, Salatu wa Salam ala Rasulillah. Um, is there a specific dua to say before the beginning of Ramadan? No, there isn't. As far as I'm aware, Allahu A'lam. Um, but a person can make general dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. During Qunut, what, how should we raise our hands? Just like we do in the prayer, outside the prayer, it's the same way. By raising the hands, putting them together, cupping them. Um, so that is the, 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 the better way. Allah knows best. Um, also that uh, between the Adhan and Ikama, we find that it is better to make du'a during that time rather than sitting around chatting, which is permissible. It's not that it's not permissible to talk between during the um, adhan and the iqama, but what is better is uh, to uh, make du'a to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And with that, we come to the end. Subhanakallahu wa bihamdika, shadu wa la ilaha illallah, anta astaghfiruka wa tubu alayk, wa sallallahu wa nubi'ilu Muhammad.